Hello, hello, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, hi, Daisy. Hello. Hello. Yes, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hopefully, everyone's having a pretty good day. Love the nails. Oh, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure about the green. It's kind of got a Maleficent vibe to it, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but yeah, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> You've got to see Fonny Willis's Jim Jordan letter. She responded. Did she respond? Oh my gosh, really? Oh wow, that's I didn't think she would respond. The nails in the ring. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I'm, oh, you like the green nails. Oh, well, thank you, that's very kind of you. <laughs> I wasn't sure, so I was like, well, we'll just have a little fun, I suppose. Hello, hello. She's, she did, oh my gosh, well, I'm gonna have to look it up now, everybody. Let me look it up real, real quick. Ooh, abuse of authority. Looking good so far. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. I wonder when this is gonna cease to be funny. <laughs> I'm thinking never. I think it will always be fun. <laughs> oh goodness. Oh dear. Oh dear. goodness <laughs> I just oh my gosh oh wow of course I'm printing it of course I am <laughs> oh my gosh hello hello everybody hello good to see you so let me just adjust my camera a little bit again here sorry about that a little wonky there we go hopefully I'm in frame Hopefully, but um, hello, hi, hi, Tara, hello, good to see you, Cobalt, welcome. Let me go grab that letter real quick. Yes, yes. Uh, six o'clock usually. Um, <laughs> sometimes I try to pop on a little bit early. Yes, for Halloween, Halloween. Um, to kind of uh, give everyone a chance to uh, come on in and get their notifications and so on. So this is the, um, the best time for me. So, oh, from Australia. Well, hello, hello. Oh my goodness. So we have another letter. <laughs> it looks like I just printed this. Thank you for telling me. I I did not realize. I I didn't think she would respond back uh, to this. So this is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Nope. I'm just getting started. Just getting started. Yeah. Hot off the press. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now he did not win his party's. Uh, voting right so he's not in the running then for speaker so we do know that but interesting timing here yes I am a lawyer yes this is the <laughs> this, oh this just came out <laughs> I just it's cracking me up oh my gosh yeah yeah we're trying to stop this stuff as well <laughs> 
Oh my goodness. Yes. I may need to take us through this letter. It's only, yeah, it's only a page. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, Fonny's really working hard. She's working hard. I love coming here and being a G. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah, Jim, Jim bag. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Really? For the, so Susan, the hunter, uh, hunter case has been dropped? Wow, that's exciting. That's very exciting. It was thin, you know, it was real thin before. So I'm not, I'm not too surprised about that at all. But hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Oh, the gun charge. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, good. I'm glad I'm, you know, I think I had mentioned before that the uh, law was kind of, mm, it was a questionable there, questionable. We weren't sure really how constitutional that law was. One was dropped. The other three are still pending. Okay, all right. Good to know. I'll have to make sure I get updates on that. Yes, I've got my mood ring on tonight. So, <laughs> yes, it was, it was, okay, hi all, just in time, yes, welcome, welcome, hello, yes, yes, oh, thank you, Dina, thank you, yep, nope, I'm back, I'm glad to be back, love the nails, oh, that's so nice of you, yeah, no, I haven't read yet, Angela, I haven't read it yet, I just, I just printed it out, um, so we can take a look at it, it's only a few paragraphs, I'm very excited about it. Your content's awesome, thank you. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, no, I do not do um, any family law cases. Uh, I'm not really taking any cases uh, now, so, um, but I wish you the best of luck. Yes, Fonny's response, yes, yes. Thank you for doing this, I really enjoyed it. Oh, good, I'm so glad to hear that, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, family law is brutal. Oh, I wish everyone the absolute best of luck. Absolute best of luck for you, though. Yes, we'll laugh through the letter. Well, <laughs> I hope so. So I have um, a couple of things for us to go through tonight. I do have um, a, just a couple updates. And the Santos indictment, the superseding indictment, I did print out so we can kind of take a look at it. There's a lot of counts, and so we can kind of go through the different counts. It's very, it's very interesting. Uh, I also then have an update on uh, the Cohen case. Is this response to the one we read last week where you said she might reply? Yes, exactly, exactly. I did not think she would reply, but you know, a page and a half I think is, you know, we'll have to see what she says, but I, I'm surprised, I'm surprised <laughs> for sure, for sure. So we will uh, definitely, um, go through the Santos indictment. And then I do have, again, we had been talking about the New York criminal case. And so I thought I would take you through um, Michael Cohen's. Uh, he had some things going on, as we all know. So kind of taking you through, reading through his uh, court order that he had that kind of triggered everything that's been going on for the civil case in New York. So it's very interesting as well. So I'll take you through that. And then we'll kind of do a few little updates too. So we've got uh, lots of fun stuff for tonight. Lots of fun stuff. So let me start here with Miss Fonny's letter uh, to Jim Jordan. So I, I probably won't make a sticky note for this because it's it's here. And then on the other side's her signature. But so let me give you a little background into, <laughs> into what happened here. Oh my goodness. So, yes. All right. So, Jim Jordan had uh, contacted Fonny Willis, who is the district attorney in Fulton County in Georgia. And he had said, you know, send me all the information that you have on your criminal state criminal RICO case, <laughs> please. Well, actually, he didn't say please. He said, just give it to me. I would, I would like that information and I'll be taking that. So, she wrote back and said... No, we have a separation between the federal government and the state government. This is a state 
um, criminal case, you don't, you're not entitled to this, you know, information. And so, no, I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> so he wrote back and he said, you know, I'm special and I want the information <laughs> and I don't care if it's uh, none of my business. I still would like to have the information. And so <laughs> this is her response then to him. And she was like, boy, please. Oh my gosh, I'm loving it. I'm loving, I'm loving this response because, you know, I think in the end, sometimes people forget that, you know, prosecutors are a little different breed, you know, they're a little bit different. Like you can't, you can't get away with a lot going after a prosecutor, like the attorney general in New York, the DA in Georgia or Jack. I mean, they've had so much stuff come at them over the years. It's like, it's going to take a lot to even phase them at all. So let me take you through then her response. Here we go. Congressman Jim Jordan, uh, the committee on the judiciary, uh, the electronic mail. Dear Mr. Jordan, <laughs> I can already feel the tension coming off. I'm in receipt of your letter dated September 27th of 2023. A charitable explanation of your correspondence is that you are ignorant of the United States <laughs> and the Georgia constitutions and codes. <laughs> a more troubling explanation is that you are abusing your authority as chairman of the committee on the judiciary to attempt to obstruct and interfere with a Georgia criminal prosecution. And she's citing the Georgia state code. Indeed, you confess to this motivation. Oh dear. On Mark Levin, uh, Mark Levin, September 10th, 2023 show, when discussing one of my office's active pros uh, prosecutions, you boasted, quote, we're trying to get all the answers, but we're trying to stop this stuff as well. Emphasis added. End note here. So she's citing uh, Life, Liberty, and Levin, Fox News here. So back up we go. While you may enjoy immunity under the United States Constitution's speech or debate clause, that does not make your behavior any less offensive to the rule of law. As the person chosen by the citizens of Fulton County to be their district attorney, I serve them and my team and I are exceptionally busy. <laughs> That's true. That's a true story right there. We have already written a letter, which I have attached again for your reference, explaining why the legal positions you advance are meritless. Nothing you've said in your latest letter changes that fact. As I have explained, your requests implicate significant, well-recognized confidentiality interests related to an ongoing criminal matter, as well as serious constitutional concerns regarding federalism and separation of powers. To the extent you have specific questions about the Department of Justice's communications, we refer you to the Department of Justice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> To the extent you have specific questions about our use of federal funds, we have already provided you with the extensive information and further information can be found here at www.justice.gov slash grants. Oh my gosh, Bonnie is hilarious. Uh, my attached prior letter provided you with four noble suggested uses of your authority as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. One, enhancing funding for victim witness advocates. Two, expanding funding for testing of all these kinds of kits. Three, supporting the Credible Messengers Program, which helps to turn around children in trouble with the criminal justice system. And four, ensuring adequate funding to support state crime labs which test for drugs like fentanyl. I would encourage you to focus your attention on those issues, which would make life better for the American people. <laughs> Yours in service, Bonnie Willis, Fulton County District Attorney. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. This woman doesn't have time for this kind of stuff. Like, what is it that he's doing so he can just kind of lollygag around and <laughs> keep sending these letters? Uh, it's cracking me up. It's absolutely cracking me up. It's, uh, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> uh, right, exactly. She's like, yeah, I got, I got five minutes. I'll give you five minutes. <laughs> and she puts this letter together. So we love that. We love that. Dragon Congressman. <laughs> yeah, she's not... 
she doesn't have time for this. I'm like I said, prosecutors they're a little bit different. <laughs> they're a little they're a little different. They don't have time for all of that shenanigans. <laughs> Oh, she does not pull punches. That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. All right. All right. So, uh, everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. That was the uh, funny Willis letter. Thank you for telling me about that. I did not know <laughs> that she had sent that in uh, today. So we love that. We love that. So I have a couple of things here uh, that we can go through. So I did. I was able to pull out the Santos uh, indictment, so I can go through that. And then I also have the Michael Cohen uh, information for his criminal case that started the civil case. And I've got an update out of Georgia. So that's really what I've got uh, to go through tonight. If everyone, are you still interested in going through the Santos indictment? Uh, because I thought I would probably just do an overview, just walk you through it rather than reading uh, line by line, but just kind of explaining everything. Okay, yes, yes, that's still working. Okay, okay, excellent. Just wanted to make sure everyone was still um, interested in that. So here we go. This is a superseding indictment, and a superseding indictment means an indictment's already been filed, but they are adding charges to it. Uh, sometimes, like in Florida, they're adding defendants, but here they're just keeping it as one defendant, but adding more charges here. So uh, let me walk you through. We've got a grand jury again indictment. And reminder, grand jury is pulled in in order to determine if there's probable cause to charge a particular person with a particular offense. So they are given the information, the evidence by the prosecutor, and then they make a decision based off of probable cause. We need proof beyond a reasonable doubt in order to convict. So that's a much higher burden of proof that's needed. But still, we've got a grand jury here, and they came back in with multiple counts. So here is our introduction to all counts. We have relevant individuals and entities, and they've listed George Anthony DeVolder Santos here, uh, House of Representatives, DeVolder Santos for Congress, Sticky note. Yes, thank you for the reminder. I appreciate that. I have it right next to my hand and still need the reminder. <laughs> All right, Santos indictment. Here we go. Thank you for walking us through. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting situation. So uh, we've got uh, Santos here. The next one we have is Santos for Congress, also known as the committee. Uh, they are listed as one of the parties. Hope you have hydration available. I do. I have a regular and then I have another cup of tea. I've got two cups of tea ready for me tonight, everybody. <laughs> I'm ready to go. We have Nancy Marks as a party and she was the treasurer of the committee. We have the National Party Committee, number one. So that's another party here, which is an entity. Um, then we have the DeVolder Organization, LLC, which is a Florida company. Uh, so they're just setting out again who, who all the people are that are involved. Company one, an entity, the identity of which is known to the grand jury, was a Florida LLC formed here in November. So they're talking again about company we have committee number one. Now we have company number one. We have person number one, an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury again. And this person is a political consultant, but they're not being named. Yeah, George. Oh, trouble, trouble. Yeah, he's got some pretty serious troubles here. All right. And the next and last party we have is an investment firm number one, which... Uh, their identity is known to the grand jury, but again, not listed. So those are the uh, relevant parties involved. So next, they have set out number two, applicable campaign finance laws. So we've got the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, and it is as exciting as you are imagining that it is. <laughs> We have uh, a little explanation of that, prohibiting a federal candidate or an agent of a federal candidate from soliciting, receiving, directing, or transferring funds in connection with a federal campaign. 
uh, unless the funds are subject to limitations, prohibitions, and reporting requirements of the Election Act. So they're just stepping through and saying, hey, look, the Election Act, there's certain limitations, certain things that you have to um, disclose. All right. So that's the law that's involved. Uh, we've got limitations. We've got prohibitions. It prohibits a person from making a political contribution in the name of another person, including by giving funds to a straw or conduit contributor for the purpose of having that straw donor or conduit pass the funds onto a federal candidate as his or her own contribution. So again, just kind of explaining a little bit more. So the FEC required authorized campaign committees, such as the committee named here earlier, to file periodic reports of receipts and disbursements, identifying, among other things, each person or organization that made a contribution to such committee during the relevant reporting period, and so on. So anything over $200 needed to be reported under that Election Act. Again, I'm just summarizing and, and taking us through uh, what's what the law is here. I won't spend a lot of time on that so that nobody falls asleep, <laughs> including myself. Uh, so they're just explaining how the FEC is involved as well. And then an independent expenditure only committee or a super PAC right, was a type of political committee that could accept unlimited contributions and make unlimited expenditures independent of a candidate or campaign. So again, they're just setting out what a super PAC is. So uh, we've got we've got that set out. So those, those, that's just the basic law. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. And then number three, they're going to start going into the defendant's campaign-related fraudulent schemes. Now, they're again, they're doing a brief overview here, and then we will start to get into each individual count. So during the 2022 election cycle, the defendant, Santos, devised and executed at least three fraudulent uh, schemes, so we have three, to obtain money for himself and for the committee by making various material misrepresentations and omissions to, among others, the FEC, so you don't want to do that. That's the Federal uh, Election Commission, the National Party Committee, number one, potential co uh, contributors to the committee and to the public. First, in or about December of 2021 and November of 2022, the defendant and Nancy Marks devised and executed a scheme to submit materially false reports. We're back to false reports again. This seems to be kind of an ongoing theme right now in the world. <laughs> Are these false reports repeatedly <sighs> to the FEC on behalf of the committee in which they fraudulently inflated the committee's fundraising numbers for the purpose of misleading the FEC, the National Party Committee, number one, and the public. The purpose of the scheme was to qualify Santos for different phases of the program and thereby receive financial and logistical support from National Party Committee, number one. As part of the party program scheme, Santos and Marx agreed to falsely report to the FEC and family members of Santos and Marx had made significant financial contributions to the committee. When Santos and Marx both knew that these individuals had not made the reported contributions. Further, as part of the party program scheme, Santos and Marx agreed to falsely report to the FEC that Santos had loaned the committee significant amounts, sums of money when Santos had not made the reported loans and, in fact, did not have the funds necessary to make such loans at the time. So that's number one. And again, uh, we'll go into the count breakdown in a minute. They're just kind of setting up this overview here with Santos. <laughs> I don't know. He probably feels like he wants to. Rearrange here for a second. Where did the money come from? Great question. Second, in or about December of 2021 and August of 2022, the defendant devised and executed a fraudulent scheme whereby he stole personal identity, you're not supposed to do that, and financial information of individuals who had contributed to the committee and used it to cause these individuals' as credit cards to be charged repeatedly without authorization, known as the credit card fraud scheme. So let's just highlight this point. <laughs> it looks like they're naming the different schemes. So if they're taking the time to name them, the least we can do is highlight those names. <laughs> so we have the party program scheme, 
we have the credit card fraud scheme. So <laughs> let's see what else we have here. Uh, for the purpose of concealing the true uh, source of funds and circumventing campaign contributions. So that's the second part. Third, in or about September and October of 2022, Santos devised and executed a scheme to defraud and obtain money from supporters of his candidacy for the House by fraudulently inducing them to contribute funds to Company One under the false pretense that the money would be used to support Santos's candidacy. In truth, Santos spent thousands of dollars of the solicited funds on personal expenses, including luxury designer clothing. Oh, that's not good. That's never a good sign. And credit card payments, uh, the company fraud scheme. So that's the third fraud scheme. All right, so we've got three <laughs> fraud schemes. Now we'll get into some, <laughs> some subcategories here. Santos personally and through person one communicated false information about Company One to those supporters, including that Company One was a Section 501c4. Uh, this is that category that makes you uh, tax exempt as a nonprofit. So that's under the tax code. Social welfare uh, organization or an independent expenditure only committee, and that contributions made to Company One would be used on independent expenditures to support Santos's candidacy during the 2022 election cycle. In actuality, Company One was neither a Section 501c4 organization nor an independent expenditure only committee. And upon receipt of contributions by those supporters to Company One, Santos converted much of those funds to his own personal benefit. Ooh, that's not good either. <laughs> that's, that's, it's not looking good right now. <laughs> All right, so now they'll break down each of the three schemes. The first one, the party program scheme. So we go through, and let's let's look at the kinds of cash we're talking about here. So Santos and Marx sought for the committee to report fundraising totals sufficient to meet the $250,000 threshold necessary to qualify for the second phase of the program. For example, on or about April 1st, Marx emailed the defendant and other agents of the committee stating, our goal is to go higher each quarter. So as everyone is aware, it is to make the program. That's a direct quote. What's the difference between 501c3 and 501c4? Oh, I'm um, not sure. Let me just look here. Right, so 501c3 uh, sets out, um, let me just take a look here exactly. Uh, those are the exemption requirements for organizations. And so what it takes in order to be a 501c uh, tax exemptions, and then the c4 sets out um, the types. So we've got uh, exemption requirements under 501c3 and then types of organizations exempt under 501c4. So just a distinction between types. Right, right, exactly. Exactly. So either way, it just has to do with, um, you know, what it takes in order to qualify as a nonprofit. That's really the key. You can't have any kind of profit involved. Um, all right, so uh, we've got the committee failed to qualify for the program because it failed to report the $250,000 contribution from a third party. And then this is a text message that was involved. Uh, it was a check-in, and it says, uh, Santos, that the only driver that matters is raising two hundred fifty k, not loans or candidate contributions in a single quarter. And it's really that simple, though. Two hundred fifty k raised from donors within a quarter. We haven't done that yet, and that should be our focus. And then the response from Santos was, "We're going to do this a little different." I got it. Well, that's a little suspicious. 
So it looks like they're setting out how he went about trying to get this $250,000, all right? So this is a sub uh, chapter, a sub total or sub category underneath that. So we've got a couple of dates here where they conspired and agreed to falsely inflate the committee's fundraising totals, including but not limited to, in public filings with the FEC. That's, you, know, you don't wanna do that. In order to mislead the FEC, the National Party, and the public, uh, that he would qualify for the program and receive financial and logistical support from the National Party. In furtherance of the scheme to defraud, the defendant texted Marks a list of names and family members of Santos and Marks, along with purported contribution amounts for each corresponding family member for Marks to enter into the year-end 2021 report to the FEC for the purpose of ensuring that the committee appeared to reach the $250,000 threshold necessary to qualify for the second phase of the program. Contrary to the representations made by Santos, none of the family members of Santos and Marx had made or ever did make the listed contributions. Oh, now they got the family involved. Oh, we don't like that. That's not, that's not very good. Specifically, the defendant Santos's text messages here falsely stated the following non-existent contributions from the committee. A $5,800 contribution from contributor one, an indi individual, the identities known by the grand jury. 5,800 contribution from contributor number two, protect the voice, hydrate soon. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm so thankful for that an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury, and another 5,800 contribution, number three, uh, 5,800 for number four, 5,800 number five. Wow, they didn't even change the amounts. 5,800 number six, 5,800 number seven, 5,800 number eight, 5,800 number nine. And then, okay, well, here's a change, right? I mean, so half of that <laughs> was from contributor number 10. So we have 10 contributors here with all the almost exact same amount of money and for a total of $55,100, <laughs> all right? That doesn't seem very, it doesn't seem very, <laughs> yeah, it, I don't know. It doesn't seem very uh, sketchy <laughs> at this point. It seems like you probably could have hidden things a little bit better with that platform nine and three fourths. <laughs> All right, not much, yeah, not much easier than that. December 21st, Marx texted the defendant, Santos seeking the list of donors, your family. Santos again texted Marx the names of purported contribution amounts for contributors one through 10. Here, this time Santos also included addresses and occupations for his relatives information Santos knew would be required for the year and report. That same day, Marx emailed herself the content of this text message. Wow. So in January of 2022, Santos repeatedly texted Marx about the ensuring that the committee reached a $250,000 threshold necessary to qualify for the second phase of the program. He advised Marx that he would really like to know the final numbers for the quarter. Um, and then on January 31st, Santos asked Marx, what did we figure out about the report and expressed he was lost and desperate. All right. On January 31st, the committee submitted the year end report to the FEC and Nancy Marx certifying that she had examined this report and to the best of her knowledge and belief it is true, correct and complete. So here is the chart, and again, this is pretty easy to figure out. The contributions are all the same number, even though they're by different people. So <laughs> that's, oh. you've just got the same sets of numbers, pretty much. The year-end 2021 report further falsely reported a contribution of $2,900 from another family member of Nancy Marks, contributor number 11, an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury. These falsely reported contributions contained the year-end 2021 report to the FEC totaling 53,200, causing the committee to falsely claim total quarterly receipts of $250,000, 549.68, thereby surpassing the $250,000 threshold 
necessary to qualify for the second phase of the program. Both uh, Santos and Marx knew that none of these reported contributions were true. So that's part one. Part two, the defendant qualifies for the second phase of the program. Following the submission of the fraudulent year-end 2021 report to the FEC on or about February 10th, the defendant, Santos, signed an application for the program and caused it to be submitted to the National Party Committee. The application noted that candidates accepted into the program would be eligible for additional campaign financial support, such as hybrid ads, coordinated expenditures, focus groups, splitting the cost of polling, etc. Santos also submitted a biography falsely asserting, among other things, that he had worked for several prominent Wall Street financial institutions. So I guess that's false. He did not work for several Wall Street financial institutions. On or about February 23rd, the defendant texted Nancy Marks, I got in the program. <laughs> that's an important piece of evidence. <sighs> Based in part on its belief, the committee had exceeded the $250,000 quarterly fundraising benchmark as reported in the year-end 2021 report to the FEC and the committee. Uh, the committee announced that the defendant, uh, Santos, as a candidate for the second phase of the program on or about February 25th. Number three, fraudulent April 2022 quarterly report. In or about between March and April of 2022, the defendant and Marx continued their efforts to falsely inflate the committee's fundraising totals, including but not limited to in public filings and the FEC, in order to mislead the FEC and the National Committee and the public, whoops, <laughs> so, that the uh, so that Santos would qualify for all phases of the program and receive financial and logistical support from the National Committee. I love that the GOP couldn't put, oh, I know, he's the AG. I know, I love that VC. That's one of my favorite things ever. <laughs> Truly, it is. Santos and Marx agreed to falsely represent in presentations and communications with National Party Committee and in quarterly submissions to the FEC. Uh, Santos had loaned the committee $500,000 when, in fact, he had not. In approximately March of 2022, Santos continued to express concern with ensuring that the committee reported favorable fundraising totals in the first quarter. For example, on March 7th, a defendant texted an associate, I have my back against the wall this quarter, lol. <laughs> oh my goodness. Similarly, on March 15th, uh, the defendant texted another associate about the importance of the committee reporting substantial fundraising totals for the purpose of ensuring he qualified for the program and would receive the expected financial support from the National Party. I have a very important meeting at the end of the week with the National Party. This meeting will decide if they will invest in my race, and so we need to come in with very strong fundraising numbers. There are several million dollars on the line with this, and having your name as a contributor to my campaign would be very a very great help. On or about March 21st, the defendant caused agents of the committee to deliver a path to victory presentation to the National Party Committee, which falsely represented to the National Party Committee staff members that the defendant was loaning the committee $500,000 during the first quarter of 2022. Further, the pre presentation listed as key factor uh, the defendant's personal and political capital that will allow for a fully funded operation. When agents of the committee inquired, the defendant uh, falsely represented that he was, in fact, making the purported $500,000 loan to the committee. For example, on March 30th, an agent of the committee texted the defendant, random, did you get the wire done for that Q1 loan? And defendant responded, that's getting done tomorrow and it's not a wire banker check. However, Defendant did not provide the committee with a check for the purported $500,000 loan, nor did he wire transfer such funds at that time. Moreover, at that time, the defendant did not have the funds to cover such a loan. In truth, the defendant had less than $8,000 in his personal and business bank accounts. That's a lot less than $500,000. That's a lot less, everybody. Oh my gosh, that's quite a bit. Yeah, 8,000, yikes, yikes, yikes. 
On or about April 13th, the committee further publicized inaccurate fundraising totals for the committee for the first total of 2022, relying on false representation by the defendant that he had loaned the committee $500,000. Specifically, the committee issued a press release in which it stated the committee would report roughly $800,000 raised in the first quarter, a significant sum in what, in what is likely to be uh, one of the most expensive races in the country. This statement of the fundraising totals of the committee included the non-existent $500,000 loan purportedly made by the defendant. The press release further uh, reported that the defendant had qualified for the second phase of the program by the National Committee, a sign of national political parties' growing interest and belief in the competitiveness of this seat. On or about April 15th, the committee submitted the April 2022 quarterly report, with Nancy Marks certifying that she had examined this report. And to the best of my knowledge and, tr and belief, it's true and correct and complete. See, anytime you sign something, that actually has to be true. Uh, April of 2022 quarterly report uh, to the FEC falsely reported that Santos had loaned the committee $500,000 on March 31st. The defendant and Marks did so for the purpose of marking the committee, making the uh, committee appear more financially sound than it was, knowing that the FEC National Party Committee and the public would rely on the truth and accuracy of these reports. So that's not looking, that's not looking very good uh, at all. <laughs> that's not looking good for him. Number four, National Party Committee, number one, provides financial support to the committee. Based in part on the misrepresentations made by the defendant and Ms. Marks about the financial position of the committee in its reports to the FEC, presentations to the National Party Committee, and public uh, statements, National Party Committee Number 1 announced the defendant had qualified for the third and final phase of the program on or about June 14th of 2022. As a result, the, defendant, uh, the defendant's qualification for the third and final phase of the program uh, they provided financial and logistical support to the committee. For example, on or about September 27th of 2022, the National Party and committee agreed to split the cost of a political poll, financial assistance that the defendant knew to be a benefit derived from his qualification for the third and final phase of the program. So they're showing intent here that he knew what was going on. Similarly, qualification for the third and final phase of the program entitled the defendant to participate in joint fundraising committees with other qualified members of the program. On or about September 28th, the committee and another political committee affiliated with the defendant during the first quarter um, of 20, oops, during the first quarter of 2022. Let me just make sure here. Yep, I flipped the wrong way. Hold on, back we go. All right. The committee and another political committee affiliated with Santos received wire transfers from a joint fundraising committee for qualified members of the program. On or about October 18th, the committee and another political committee affiliated with Santos received a second, second round of wire transfers from a joint fundraising committee for qualified members of the program. All right, so he received huge benefits from this false information that he had included in his uh, financial reports. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> All right, B, the credit card fraud scheme. As part of the credit card fraud scheme, the defendant obtained the personal identif identity and financial information of individuals who had contributed to the committee and then caused their access devices to be charged repeatedly without authorization for the defendant's direct and indirect benefit oftentimes concealing the true source of funds by misappropriating the personal identity information of relatives and associates of Santos without their authorization. Whoa, so he, this is involving his family then. So he took money from his family, from his family's credit cards? Is that right? Oh my gosh, that's awful. 
For example, on or about December 14th, contributor 12, an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury, texted the defendant and another agent of the committee providing billing information for two credit cards belonging to contributor 12 for the purpose of authorizing a contribution to the committee. Thereafter, on or about December 17th, the defendant caused $5,800 contribution to be made to the committee using the credit card billing information provided by contributor 12. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Can you imagine a relative who's running for office taking your credit card and charging $5,800 on it? Can you even imagine what would happen? I mean, that wouldn't work in my family. That You wouldn't get away with that. Yeah, there would be bad things that would happen to you. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to go into details, but it would not be a pretty sight. I know, right? Right? Huh, that same day, the defendant caused two other contributions to be made to the committee or affiliated p political committees using the credit card billing information. Nailgate is now over. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. Nailgate. What did I miss, everybody? <laughs> Oh my goodness, now I've rekindled Nailgate. No! <laughs> I thought his family members put up his bail. Yeah, well, they probably didn't know that they had. He probably used their credit cards. <laughs> Nothing carry on. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I feel terrible for his family here. All right, so affiliated political committees using the credit card billing information provided by contributor number 12. As a result, the defendant caused approximately $15,800 in campaign contributions to the committee or affiliated political committees to be charged to credit cards of contributor 12. So one contribute one person, one family member, $15,000. Look like flames. Oh, NASCAR. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. The total exceeded the limits set by the Election Act for the 2022 election cycle for the individual contributions to candidate committees. Contributor number 12 did not know or authorize ch charges to exceed such limits for the purpose of masking the true source of some of these funds and thereby circumventing the Election Act's limits on the amounts and sources of money that could be contributed to a federal campaign for elected office, the defendant falsely identified the source of the funds for one of those unauthorized charges to be a relative of Santos person number two, an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury. As a result of the defendant's fraudulent deception, the committee submitted the year-end 2021 report to the FEC on or about January 31st, which falsely identified person number two as the source of the funds for a $2,400 contribution and a $2,600 contribution, both made on December 17th. In the following months, without the knowledge or authorization of Contributor 12, wow, if I was Contributor 12, I would be so mad. The defendant uh, repeatedly used the credit card billing information of Contributor 12 in attempts to make at least $44,000, $44,800 in unauthorized charges on a credit card, on a family member's credit card. Wow, that's awful. That's, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. Santos attempted to use the credit card billing information of uh, contributor number 12 to make contributions to the committee and to the campaign committees of other candidates for election office in the names of, among others, Santos himself, person number two, person number three, an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury, and person number four, an individual whose identity is known to the grand jury. On at least one occasion, the defendant used the credit card billing information for contributor number 12 to transfer more than $11,000 to Santos's personal bank account, again, without knowledge or authorization of contributor number 12. On or about August 1st, the defendant used the credit card billing information for contributor 12 to cause a charge of $12,000 using the credit card processing account of company number one. Of that sum, approximately $11,651.70 was transferred to the bank account of company number one. That same day, approximately $11,580 was then transferred from the bank account of company number one to the personal bank account of Mr. Santos. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah, I I would imagine contributor number 12 had something to do with how this came to light. 
In addition to contributor number 12, the defendant used the credit card billing information of other individuals to contribute to the committee and to the campaigns of other candidates for elected office, all without the knowledge or authorization of individual cardholders. Again, in an effort to mask the true source of the funds and to circumvent the Election Act's limits on individual contributions, Santos repeatedly masked those fraudulent transactions by using the names of other unwitting individuals, including individuals who had previously contributed to his campaign and his own relatives, among others. Oh my gosh, this is really bad. This is really bad. I have to stop to hydrate. That's so bad. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's enough to pay him back for helping you move. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a lot. This is a lot. The company number one fraud scheme. As part of company number one fraud scheme, the defendant directed person one to solicit contributions to company one from the prospective contributors via emails, text messages, and telephone calls. In furtherance of those efforts, Santos arranged for the creation of an email address associated with company number one for person number one, provided person number one with the names and contact information of prospective contributors and conveyed false information to person number one about the nature of company number one and the purpose of the contributions, knowing that person number one uh, would then communicate the false information to prospective contributors. Oh my goodness. Oh, this person is in trouble. At the direction of the defendant, person one falsely advised prospective contributors in her alia that company one was a section 501c4 social welfare organization or an independent expenditure only committee and therefore not subject to contribution limits. And the contributions to company one would be spent on television advertisements and other independent expenditures benefiting Santos's candidacy for the house. At the direction of Santos, Person 1 was provided prospective contributors with instructions for wiring funds to a bank account maintained by Company 1, as to which Santos was an authorized signatory. Wow. Under Company 1 bank account. It was further a part of the scheme to defraud that the defendant sent a prospective contributors one or more text messages in which he requested those prospective contributors speak with representatives of company one, indicated that he needed contributions to company number one and falsely represented that such contributions would be spent on television advertisements independently purchased by company one in support of Santos's candidacy for the house. After receiving emails and text messages from the defendant, uh, and person one, and in reliance upon materially false statements therein, one or more individuals made contributions to company number one in sums exceeding the limits pertaining to the candidate committees. Yikes. On or about September 12th, the defendant falsely advised person one via text message that company one was a small C4 that existed just to help this race and that there were no limits with respect to the contributions. Section 501c4 of the Internal Revenue Code related to tax-exempt social welfare organizations. Santos knew that company number one was not, in fact, registered with the Internal Revenue Service as a Section 501c4 social welfare organization. On or about October 4th, Person 1, acting at the direction of the defendant and on behalf of the company, sent an email to contributor 13, uh-oh, Anytime we have another contributor, I start, I'm start. i starting to get worried after what happened with contributor number 11. I have concerns. An individual whose identity is known to the grand jury, that email falsely stated inter alia that company one was attempting to raise another $700,000 to reach our goal of $1.5 million to invest in the defendant's race to compete with the money independently, independently raised for the defendant's opponent. Thereafter, on or about October 20th, person one, again, acting at the, direct, at the direction of Santos and on behalf of company one, sent contributor 13 another email, which falsely stated, so they represented company one. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what it's sounding like. 
uh, another email which falsely stated that the contribution from Contributor 13 would be spent, at least in part, to get her advertising up on TV. On or about October 25th, person one again, acting at the direction of the defendant and on behalf of the company, sent to a Contributor 13 a text message, which again falsely stated that a contribution from Contributor 13 would be spent, at least in part, to purchase ads supporting George Santos. On or about October 26th, in reliance upon these emails and text messages, Contributor 13 caused the sum of $25,000. Oh my gosh, Contributor 13, no. <laughs> to be wired to Company 1. Oh no, <laughs> that's terrible. Oh, that's terrible. All right, that's another, that's another bad one. All right. <sighs> In addition... On or about October 12th, person one, acting at the direction of the defendant and on behalf of company one, sent an email to contributor 14. Oh no, oh no, each one gets worse, everybody. An individual whose identity is known to the grand jury. That email falsely stated inter alia that company one was formed exclusively to aid in electing Santos and that, quote, there are no limits for contributors as we are a 501c4 independent expenditure committee under the federal campaign finance law and do not coordinate directly with the Santos campaign. The email to contributor number 14 further stated that all funds raised by company number one would spend directly on supporting George and his election. Further, the email to con Contributor 14 contained an attachment, which Santos had previously approved. The attachment described company number one as having been created for this singular purpose to support that candidate, Santos, and represented the company. Uh, number one was fully committed to dedicating all of its resources into making sure Santos is the next member of Congress representing New York. Uh, number three, let's, let's skip down a little bit so that we're not all waiting with, uh, bated breath. So contributor number four, how much did you contribute? $25,000. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All right. All right. So we're at $50,000 from two contributors after contributor number 12 had already been taking care of a lot. <laughs> Isn't that likable? Well, he's really not. This certainly isn't helping. <laughs> it certainly is not helping. All right. Shortly after contributions from contributor 13 and contributor 14 were received, uh, the bank account they were transferred into were controlled by the defendant, including uh, the Santos bank account number one and a second personal bank account maintained by Santos. From there, the funds received from Contributor 13 and Contributor 14 were spent by Santos for his personal benefit, including, yikes, to make cash withdrawal, personal purchases and luxury designer clothing, credit card payments, a car payment, payments on personal debts, and one or more bank transfers to Santos's personal associates. Thus, contrary to the representations made by Santos and person number one, who was acting at the direction of the defendant. These contributions to company one were not spent on television advertisements or other independent expenditures in support of Santos's candidacy for the house. So he paid, yeah, car payment. What? <laughs> what is he doing? Want to run right out there, vote? I know. Well, I don't know. I mean, is this how you make money? Is just by running for, for an office? This is awful. All right, number four, the defendant's employment-related fraudulent schemes. So we've only got a couple pages left here, and then we'll get into the actual counts. So here's A, fraudulent application for and receipt of unemployment benefits. All right. On or about March, March, on or about March 27th of 2020. The uh, Aid Relief Economic, so the CARES Act was enacted. In light of the ongoing health crisis related to the novel issue that was going on, they allocated additional unemployment benefits for eligible individuals. Specifically, the CARES Act established additional unemployment insurance programs, include, including the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program and the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program. Both programs were federally funded and were administered by states, including New York. Funds from both programs, as well as the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Lost Wage Assistance Program. Man, could they make these titles any longer? <laughs> Seriously. 
<sighs> comprised the benefits fraudulently obtained by the defendant Santos in connection with the scheme outlined below. On or about June 17th of 2020, Santos applied to receive unemployment insurance benefits through the New York Department of Labor. In the application, Santos falsely claimed to have been unemployed since the week of March 22nd of 2020, beginning on or about June 19th of 2020, and continuing through or about April 15th of 2021. Santos certified his continuing eligibility for unemployment benefits on a weekly basis, in each case falsely attesting inter alia that he was unemployed and available to take on new work and eligible for benefits. In truth and in fact, however, beginning on or about February 3rd of 2020 and continuing through on or about April 15th of 2021, Santos was a regional director I'm worried. I'm worried. What's it going to say? No. At investment firm number one. During that period, with the exception of approximately July 5th of 2020 through August 30th of 2020, Santos received regular deposits into his personal bank account as part of his regional director's salary of approximately $120,000 per year. Ooh, yikes. For the period of approximately March 22nd of 2020 through April 15th of 2021, based on a false application and false weekly certifications to the New York Department of Labor, the defendant received approximately $24,744 in unemployment insurance benefits, which were deposited into his bank account. The benefits received by the defendant were fully funded by the United States and a department and agency thereof to wit, the United States Department of the Treasury. Oh, yikes. Yeah, that's awful. All right, so this is how much money he got from the CARES Act wrongfully. Here's B, false statements in House Disclosure Reports. Pursuant to the ethics of the Government Act of 1978, as a candidate for the House in 2020 and 2022, the defendant had a legal duty to file a financial disclosure statement at designated times prior to each of the general elections held on November 3rd of 2020 and November 8th of 2022, respectively. In each of those house disclosures, Santos was required to make a full and complete statement disclosing inner alia, his assets and income, transactions, liabilities, positions held, and arrangements and agreements. B, the source, type, and amount of value of income from any source other than the current employment of the United States government. And C, the source, date, and amount of honoraria from any source received for the year of filing and preceding the calendar year. So in other words, you really have to tell them where all of your money comes from legally. <laughs> so that's what that means. As a candidate, Santos was personally required to certify the House disclosures were true, complete, and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. The instruction guide for the financial disclosure statements published by the United States House of Representatives Committee on Ethics provided that there were civil and criminal penalties for knowingly and willingly falsifying a financial disclosure statement and cited to Title 18 of the United States Code. The defendant was required to make these House disclosures via an online filing system maintained by the House Committee of Ethics or pre-printed form and to certify that the statements made therein were true and complete. He was requested to file the House disclosures with the Clerk of the House for transmission to the House Committee. Wow. On or about May 11th of 2020, in connection with the 2020 election for the House, the defendant filed two House disclosures. The 2020 House disclosure, in which he falsely certified that during the reporting period, his only earned income consisted of salary, commission, and bonuses totaling $55,000 from Company 2, an entity uh, the identity of which is known by the grand jury, and B, the only compensation exceeding $5,000 he received from a single source in which he had an ownership interest was an unspecified commission bonus from Company Number 2. Contrary to these attestations, however, as the defendant Santos then and there well knew and believed from approximately February 1st, 2020, through the date on which he filed the 2020 house disclosures, Santos received approximately $25,000 in income from investment firm number one, which he failed to truthfully report as required. Further, Santos knew he had received only $27,555 in compensation from company number two in 2019. 
thereafter on or about September 6th of 2022, in connection with the 2022 election for the House, the defendant filed a House disclosure in which he falsely certified that during, wow, he did a lot of stuff. During the reporting period, allegedly, <laughs> he earned income consist his earning income consisted of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in salary from the the Volder organization. His unearned income included dividends from the organization LLC valued at between one million and five million. C he had no compensation exceeding five thousand dollars from a single source in which he had an ownership interest. D he owned a checking account and deposits totaling a hundred thousand dollars and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and E he owned a savings account with deposits totaling between one million and five million dollars. Contrary to these attest attestations, <laughs> as the defendant Santos then and there well knew and believed during the applicable reporting period, he had not received from the organization the reported amounts of salary or dividends. And during the reporting period, he did not maintain checking or savings accounts with deposits in the reported amount. In addition, from approximately January of 2021 through September of 2021, Santos received approximately $28,000 in income from investment firm one and $20,000 in unemployment insurance benefits from the New York State Department of Labor, both of which he failed to truthfully report as required. Wow. All right. Now we're going to get into the counts, everybody. Oh my gosh. That's a lot. Yeah, I had no idea. I had no idea it was uh, this level. If you had only put this kind of effort in, that's funny. <laughs> this is a lot. Yeah, this is quite a bit. He's, yeah, this is some serious trouble. All right. So let's go through the counts. I'll just kind of do an overview. I won't go into all of the details since we kind of set the fact pattern out earlier. So we've got count one, a conspiracy to commit offenses against the United States, the party program scheme. Again, I love how they've named each scheme separately, lest we forget. <laughs> so we have allegations contain, contains in paragraphs one through 65 are realleged and incorporated. So, and then they just set out the different pieces. I won't uh, go through this line by line again because we've we've already been through that. They're just summarizing again the amount of money that was involved. So that was for count one, and going through these different subsections here. Um, and then it's nice when they include charts. I always, I appreciate a good chart in an indictment. I respect and appreciate that. So let's take a look at the chart here. Uh, together with others did commit and, commas, and, <laughs> commas, and commit and cause the commission of, among other things, the following overt acts. Now remember, anyone who's been here for a while, Overt acts are what are required in order to prove a conspiracy. The conspiracy isn't the crime itself. The conspiracy is the plan to commit the crime. So we need some overt acts. They don't have to be illegal, but they just need to be acts showing that they're taking steps towards committing an offense. So we've got this text message that they cited earlier as one of the overt acts. And then we can flip to the other side and we have another text message, an email, uh, the submission of the report, the delivery by the agents to the committee, uh, text messages again, a press release, a submission by the committee also of the quarterly report. So each one of these is a separate overt act to try to uh, go towards that conspiracy to commit fraud. So they would only need to prove a couple of elements of this to show that the conspiracy was in place. I do need a chart emoji. I do. Oh, I love that. That's genius. All right. Counts two and three. That's not a good sign when they're doubling up counts. I'm just going to say that. Okay, everybody. I've read enough indictments to know if they're doubling up a count. That's not a good sign. All right. Wire fraud. The party program scheme. Oh, my goodness. Oh. So the allegations, again, contained are realigned or realleged here. So uh, we're going through these materially false statements, uh, setting out the different dates. So again, we've got another chart. So we have count two, and here's the date of that, a submission to the committee of the year and report. So that would be the first wire fraud uh, count. And then count three, uh, August 15th is the submission of the com uh, by the committee again of the quarterly report again. So we have two separate submissions. We have two separate counts. 
And that's how they broke that down. So we've got two counts of wire fraud here as well. Hydrate. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to have to go get my other cup of tea, actually. Okay, just one moment, everybody. I've already made it through one cup of tea. <laughs> Nancy is his treasurer. Yes, Nancy's in some trouble, or she may have agreed uh, to help out in this situation. She's in some serious trouble too, absolutely. All right, I've got my cup of tea here. I think she probably did roll, yeah, absolutely. All right, so counts two and three, these are wire fraud, and now we're into count four, false statements. And this is the year in 2021 report submitted to the FEC. So, um, falsely stating that we had the contribution of $2,900 of uh, contributor number one, all the way through contributor number 10, right? Let's just make sure. Yeah, contributor number 10 had $3,900. So each one of these was a false report on the FEC. So he was charged with that. Count five, falsification of a record or document. This is the year end 2021 report submitted to the FEC again. So let's take a look. Again, we've got uh, contributions falsely set out from contributors number one to contributors number 10 and contributor 11, looks like. Number 12 is not included yet. They're coming later. So all of these false amounts, all of these were set out falsely. So he's been charged with that. That's count five. Count six then, aggravated identity theft. I'm assuming it's aggravated uh, because they would set the different terms of identity theft based on how much uh, money or how much harm there was done. So that's why it's been bumped to an aggravated, uh, but not high enough yet to be a felony. Now, this is part of the party program scheme here. So that's count six. We've got, um, let's see. All right, let me just make sure I'm back in frame, everybody. Sorry, I need to double check. I kind of got pushed out of frame a little bit. Link tree in your, yes, we love the link tree. All right, am I in frame okay, everybody, before I dive back in? I just wanna make sure I'm not askew. I don't want to be askew, <laughs> anything but that. No askew, okay, excellent, thank you, thank you. Love the thumbs up, appreciate that. All right, so here's the next piece. This is, uh, we had the falsification of the record, and so uh, we had count six going on here. Uh, we've got contributor number one, two, three, four, five. So this is aggravated identity theft for each of these people here using all of these different names and number 11, knowingly, uh, knowing that the names that, sorry about that, knowing that the means of identification belong to said other persons. So he used each of these people's identifications. So that's why he was charged with an aggravated um, identity theft. So count seven is false statements. This is a 2022 quarterly report. And we'll take a look, falsely stating that he had loaned the committee this $500,000, contrary to those statements in truth. And in fact, uh, he did not, <laughs> he did not loan them that. So that's all they have to show is that he did not do that. Count seven. So here's count eight, falsification of a record or document. And the document we're talking about again is that quarterly report submitted to the FEC 
where he is uh, talking again about this uh, $500,000 uh, piece. Contrary to these statements in truth and in fact, Santos then and there well knew and believed and Santos had not loaned the committee $500,000. So he was charged count eight for falsification of a record. So let's just keep this uh, straight. That $500,000 was charged for false statement. So actually saying it was false and then putting it in a document is false. So that's why we have two separate counts, seven and eight. And then we've got count nine, which is the credit card fraud scheme. So that's our third scheme. On to scheme number three. Wow. Oh, goodness. We've got how much here? We have uh, did knowingly and with intent to defraud uh, with the transactions, one or more access devices for a one-year period, the value of which was greater than $1,000. So that's how the credit card fraud was involved. Now we have aggravated identity theft also in the credit card fraud scheme. So that information... Here we have during and in relation to the crime charged in count nine, did knowingly, intentionally transfer, possess, or use without lawful authority one or more means of identification of one or more persons to wit the name and access device of contributor number 12. All right. So we had all of that. We had tens of thousands of dollars uh, charged to contributor 12's credit card. So here's the I I aggravated identity theft element. So then we've got... Counts 11 through 15, so we're stacking these again, and these are all wire fraud. So each transaction is its own count, which is how we typically uh, charge. It looked like this particular is the credit card fraud of felony. This looks like it's an aggravated. Uh, so that looks to me like it would be um, the identity theft portion of it is aggravated, so that would be an aggravated misdemeanor. Uh, that would not be a felony, but again, that's for the identity theft level, but we'll get into um, the actual amounts later on too. So we've got conspiracy one, so the fraud scheme here, we've set out counts 11 through 15. So each date, uh, again, we've got um, an email on behalf of company one to contributor one. We have another email again on October uh, 12th. Ugh, all of these are wire frauds again, so let's keep that in mind. Each count, we've got an email on behalf of Company One falsely stating funds received from Contributor One would be used in part to purchase television advertisements. 14 is a text message. Uh, contributor Two falsely stating the funds would be uh, used for television. And then 15, a text message on behalf of Company One to Contributor One falsely stating again funds would be used for television ads. Then we've got count 16 through 18 unlawful monetary transactions over $10,000. This is the company number one fraud scheme. Again, they'll set out, set out each of these um, different actions as a separate count. So let's take a look. We have count 16, which was October 21st electronically transferred $25,000 from contributor number two from company one's bank account. The 17th count, October 26th, uh, transferring again $25,000 fraudulently obtained uh, as well. And then count 18 was on October 26th and we electronically transferred again $24,000. That's a lot, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. All right, count 19, theft of public money. All right, so if anyone was wondering uh, what happens if you falsely take money from the government, you can be charged. Fraudulent application for and receipt of unemployment benefits. It seems like, isn't this like one of the big, I mean, I don't like to get involved in politics, but isn't this one of the big like political campaigns is um, like public benefit misuse, like isn't that part of his party's like movement is against that, what he's actually doing here? Okay, yes, yes. I mean, I don't know. I'm really, I'm pulling at cobwebs in the back of my mind because I just don't pay attention. 
So I'm just wondering, okay. All right, so he's actually doing, <laughs> he's actually doing the crime <laughs> that, that uh, he is adamantly against. All right, all right. <laughs> oh my goodness, my goodness. Theft of public money. So let's let's take a look. We've talked about that before. That was under the CARES Act here. Um, we've got, let's just double check if they've got the amount. So we had an amount that exceeded $1,000. So I believe it was, what was it? $20, $24,000 that he got in unemployment uh, insurance from the CARES Act. So that's what was charged for count 19. So counts 20 and 21, we've got wire fraud. So this will take us through some specific actions again. Um, we've got the scheme involved here on or about January 19th. He received $564 through interstate wires through the Department of Labor in New York. And then on December 26th, he received $564 again through the wires of the New York State Department of Labor. So these are the wire transfers that went along with those unemployment benefits. Yikes. Um, so that's counts 20 and 21. Now we're at count 22. Uh, false statements for the 2020 House Disclosure Reports. Uh, we've got uh, the disclosure falsely stating during the applicable reporting period that his only earned income was this amount. That was false. Uh, only compensation was 5000 That was false. Uh, so those two pieces. And that had received $25,403 in, in income from an investment as well. So... His numbers were bad, so he was charged with false statements for this document. That's count 22. Count 23 is false statements for the 2022 disclosure reports. This was 2020. This was 2022. Gonna take a look at those false statements. Wow, this is really, oh, yikes. This is a lot. So we've got... Uh, and you're delivering the false information to an ethics committee. That's just another layer here. So we have an earned income that was incorrect. Uh, dividends were incorrect. Uh, compensation was incorrect. Owned a checking account with uh, $100,000 $100, to $250,000. That was wrong. These must be boxes that he checked. I'm loving the matching ring and nails. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah, sometimes, you know, you got to have a little something to help you get through a document. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now, he said, too, his savings was a million to five million dollars. That was false. So all of those false statements is what he's being charged with on there. Um, he received this much actually in income and this much in unemployment benefits. So that's a significant difference. Now we've got criminal forfeiture allegations as to counts 1 through 3, 11 through 15, and 19 through 21. So are, is everyone familiar with what a forfeiture is? If not, let me just uh, explain. So anytime there has been any illegal uh, gains, the government can uh, request the illegal gains. So they can request a forfeiture on it, meaning um, they can say, hey, your illegal gains, we want those because you're not, you can't keep things that you got illegally. So I'll take you through just the first couple of paragraphs to kind of explain what it is. Uh, forfeiture is very controversial. It kind of falls underneath the takings clause under the Fifth Amendment. So it's a bit controversial. The United States hereby gives notice to the defendant that upon his conviction of any of the offenses charged in counts 1 through 3, 11 through 15, and 19 through 21, the government will seek forfeiture in accordance with Title 18, United States Code, Section 90, 981, Sub A, Sub 1, Sub C, and Title 28, which require a person convicted of such offenses to forfeit any property, real or personal, constituting or derived from proceeds obtained directly or indirectly as a result of such, of such offenses. If any of the above described forfeiture property as a result of any act or omission by the defendant cannot be located upon the exercise of due diligence, been transferred or sold or deposited to a third party, has been placed beyond the jurisdiction of the court, has been uh, substantially diminished in value, or has been commingled with other property which cannot be divided without difficulty, 
it is the intent of the United States pursuant to Title 21 to seek forfeiture of any other property of the defendant up to the value of the forfeitable property described in this forfeiture allegation. All right, so <laughs> let's clarify. Let's clarify what that means. So anything that he purchased with the money that he got illegally, is, the government wants it, <laughs> all right? So remember that car payment? <laughs> remember all of those luxury goods uh, or whatever? All of that property is what the government is saying. We will be taking that <laughs> if you're found guilty. Your proceeds of crime act. Yes, Deborah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly the same. Yep, you got it. You got it. <laughs> Fancy clothes go by. Yeah. <laughs> All the designer gowns. I don't know. I mean, whatever designer goods he he got, anything that he used that money for, including a car payment, they could go after for forfeiture. And this is very normal. Uh Almost everybody does it in any kind of a criminal prosecution. If there are gains that were received from those criminal actions, the government will go after it. The government's getting a used car. Yes. <laughs> what will they do with what they take? Um, typically, what typically what happens when the government um, gets a forfeiture on criminal cases is that they will sell it. Usually, if they cannot use it. Uh, you know, sometimes there can be different uh, pieces of equipment or different tools, various things like that. If those things are forfeited, you know, the uh, police departments or the justice department might be able to actually use it. But typically what they do is they hold sales and they sell it. And then whatever they get, they put into their department. That's how uh, they make, um, they don't make very much money, but that's how they sometimes can supplement their income in that situation. Yeah, in fact, there was burner phones. <laughs> in fact, there was a very uh, important case that came down pretty recently about um, this idea that if the government takes... So, okay, here's the case. There was a, a guy who was um, small potatoes when it came to uh, marijuana usage. So it was small potatoes, it was a misdemeanor charge. He was charged, but he was in his van. Or he was in his vehicle at the time he was charged. So they impounded his vehicle. His vehicle was worth $40,000. The maximum fine he would have gotten for his criminal charge was like $5,000. So they uh, seized his car and then they said, we're going to forfeit it because you were in your car when you were doing these illegal activities. So they seized it and he said, wow, let me pay the $5,000 maximum fine. Give me back my vehicle. And they did not. So they appealed it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court held by seizing something of that amount so far outside of the fines was excessive bail and fines. And so technically, you cannot seize at that level. So that was a very important case that came down by the U.S. Supreme Court when it came to these kinds of forfeitures. Typically, though, you're not going to win on a fight for a forfeiture case. Yes, I'm eating... I'm eating. Oh, good. We love that. We love that. Yeah, that happens a lot. It really does. It really does happen. You got to be careful. But forfeitures are are pretty serious business. Uh, all right. So we've got also a criminal forfeiture allegation as to count nine as well. So again, any any ill gotten goods from those illegal gains, he could uh, the government could take. Oops. What was that? Did we miss? Did I miss a question? It sounds excessive. It was. Yeah, that was a pretty uh, significant case. Sister bought her first car at the police station. Oh, love that. Oh, Tiffany, I, that's genius. You can get some good deals. What's the difference between a civil forfeiture and a criminal? It It's just that that's the exact difference. A civil forfeiture has to do with some kind of... Um, you know, you've uh, defaulted on some kind of a loan or something like that, a civil through civil means. Criminal means there was a criminal act involved. So if you uh, use certain things in order to commit your crimes, the government can take that. Meanwhile, for a civil forfeiture, if there are obligations that you didn't meet, then they can take it for that. So that's really the difference. Will he have to forfeit his seat since he used fraudulent money for the position? That's a good question. That's a great question. I think there's tons of ethical issues going on. The fact that he lied to the ethics committee, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what they do for ethics violations in the house, but it seems like it would be something. All 
I wonder how the voters feel in his district. I mean, that's the, those are the ones that were harmed and deceived so much. I'm wondering how, how they're feeling. Hope it, hopefully somebody will take a, take a look at that and, you know, ask the voters. His voters are mad. Yeah, I would be. I would be. Yeah, yeah, I would be very, very upset. I mean, I can't even imagine. Uh, and his family. I mean, his family and friends that he, you know, totally messed with here. That wasn't very good. All right, now we've got a criminal forfeiture allegation as to count 16 through 18. So they're really covering everything here. So they are also asking then for property um, for basically all counts is what they're saying. So that takes us then to the last page uh, where there, it's a true bill and it was signed by the four person. You know, we can't really make out that signature. So I'm feeling I'm feeling OK about that. But that is the end then of the indictment uh, for Mr. Santos. And what an indictment that is. Wow. That's pretty detailed. It's not complicated. It certainly wasn't an elegant scheme by any means, but it was uh, it had multiple elements to it that. Uh, were all illegal, with lots of people involved. House has said they'll move to expel him once there's a speaker. Yeah, yeah, I I mean, you know, they got their own problems going on, but also, I mean, it looks bad for them when their own people manipulate the system like this. Again, uh, an indictment is not a showing of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but it is a showing of probable cause in order to indict, and it's a lot. There's a lot of probable cause in here. So many crimes. Yes, it is a lot. That is a lot. And huge amounts of money, too. We're not talking just, you know, $12 for glue. I mean, it's a pretty significant amount of money that was involved. Yeah, too bad. It's really, it's really too bad. I agree. Too, too bad on that. Um, all right. So... I've got uh, the next piece here was, I thought I would take you through the charges for Michael Cohen in order to kind of put into perspective the criminal case in New York and also give us a little idea about the civil case as well. <clears throat> Thank you so much for doing, oh, my pleasure. There we go, got the tea going. Yes. Well, Tony, I think if you've held your faith this long, you're doing great. You'll make it. You're going to make it to the other side. <laughs> yep. Yep. We're going to make it to the other side. <laughs> we'll make it out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Is there any update on the Cop City and Re the Rico case? No, not yet. There is no update that I know of yet. Um, I do know that there has been a couple more reports on it, but so far nothing. Um, now, my understanding too is that no one has officially been processed either. So it's still lingering. The age of accountability, you bet. Absolutely, we love that, we love that. Spilling the legal tea, <laughs> yes. All right, so as promised, I think one of the things that we all overlook, I know I do at least, is that we haven't had a floor vote for speaker yet. He doesn't have 217 votes. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, this is a very unusual situation where we just got a handful. Technically, according to historical data, the House should have flipped hard over to the Republicans, but it didn't. So it went, it completely went against uh, what's happened historically. So we're really in uncharted territory. To, to not have had it flip hard enough to the Republicans is very unusual. And so because of that, we're finding out what happens. And one of the issues is the speaker. So much criming. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. All right, so... Um, here is the indictment. I'm, I'll take you through just overview of the indictment uh, for the criminal case in New York, but I want to set it up by going through uh, Cohen's indictment. This was set up as an exhibit in the uh, Trump case. So as we all know, um, the civil case in New York is still ongoing at this point. We're into the second week and um, the information and all of that was brought about because of uh, Cohen's testimony in front of Congress. 
I've gotten a lot of questions on why didn't anyone call Donald Trump out on this before? It's been going on for a really long period of time. And, you know, I think a couple of things. I don't think the law had caught up yet to what the situation was. We needed to actually have the law passed um, before it could be used in the way that it's being used. So we needed that, first of all. And second of all, um, they didn't really have notice. And, you know, it's my thought that people may have had their suspicions, but as far as actually pursuing it without solid proof, the solid proof they needed came from his testimony. So a lot of that came all about because of his criminal charges out of New York. So that's what I'll take you through here. Could you move the papers up higher? Yes. Did I get them back in frame here? Everybody, sticky note, please. You got it. Hold on. Did I just readjust? I just readjusted them. Oh, yeah. Oh, the military appointments. Oh, my gosh. It's awful. It's awful. Uh, all right. Am I in frame? I just moved it again, so I wanted to make sure. All right. Let me do my sticky note, everybody, here, so we'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, those military appointments, that's really, that's just, it's petty is what it is. It's just petty. It's no good for anyone. All right, so this is the, let me make sure I put the correct name. And I'll kind of skip through this also. Um, just, I won't read every single line of this, but let me just make sure I've got it written correctly here. Okay, we've got this information. Here's exhibit four. All right. I thought I had gotten an extra document in there. All right, that's the protective order. So let's just make sure I've got the proper information here. Yeah, there's a forfeiture request also in Cohen's case. All right, here we go. So this is the Cohen indictment. All right, I'm labeling the sticky note right now. Indictment. And this was indicted in 2018. And again, this is the case that cracked everything else open. Okay, here we go, Cohen indictment. So let's take a look and see, let's let's review what was going on here. How do you keep it all straight? Well, <laughs> color coding helps. <laughs> all right, so we've got, uh, again, this is the indictment that came down, Michael Cohen, so let's go through it. The defendant from in or about 2007 through in or about January of 2017, Michael Cohen, the defendant, was an attorney, an employee of a Manhattan-based real estate company, the company. Cohen held the title of executive vice president and special counsel to the owner of the company. In or about January 2017, Cohen left the company and began holding himself out as the personal attorney to individual one. Does anybody remember who Individual One was? Do you remember when uh, that was such a huge deal when we kept hearing about that? <laughs> individual One. Hmm. Uh, also remember, right, when we had our election as well. So that's an important uh, note. <laughs> Number three, in addition to working for and earning income from the company at all times relevant to this information, this is a trial information, that's the charging document. So that's what they're referring to here. Michael Cohen, the defendant, owned taxi medallions in New York City and Chicago worth millions of dollars. Ooh, I didn't know that. Wow. Cohen owned these taxi medallions as investments and leased the medallions to operators who paid Cohen a portion of the operating income. Oops, hold on a minute. I need to uh, double check and make sure I'm in frame again, everybody. I'm sorry, for some reason I need to really, I move around too much. <laughs> taxi medallions, yeah, yeah. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, in New York, they're extremely careful about how many taxis that they are allowed to have. They only have a certain number of uh, medallions. And 
they're extremely competitive because there's only a set amount. So if he has medallions, that's, that's probably worth a lot of money. The tax evasion scheme. Between tax years 2012 and 2016, Cohen, the defendant, engaged in the scheme to evade income taxes by failing to report more than $4 million in income, resulting in the avoidance of taxes of more than $1.4 million due to the IRS. In or about the late 2013, Michael Cohen, the defendant, retained an accountant for the purpose of handling Cohen's personal and entity tax returns. After being retained, accountants filed amended 2011 and 2012 Form 1040 tax returns for Cohen with the Internal Revenue Service for tax years 2013 through 2016. Accountant 1 prepared individual returns for Cohen and returns for Cohen's medallion and real estate entities. To confirm he had reviewed and approved these returns, both Cohen and his wife signed a form 8879 for tax years 2013 to 2016 and filed manually for the tax year of 2012. Each form of 8879 contained an affirmation. Again, this affirmation, everybody, you got to read that. I mean, this is, that's the key. <laughs> Under penalties of perjury that Cohen examined a copy of his electronic individual income tax return and accompanying schedules and statements. And to the best of his knowledge and belief, it is true, correct, and accurately lists all amounts and sources of income that Cohen received during the tax year. So again, let this be a cautionary note to everyone. Make sure you read... <laughs> And if you're fudging, you know, just make sure you're not fudging so much that, you know, it's illegal. This always reminds me of that form. If you ever travel abroad, you have to declare anything before you come back into the country. And usually everybody just says, oh, I don't have anything to declare. Typically, that's what happens. But I have always declared everything down to like a pen that I got at a sheep shop. <laughs> I would have this list of like 500 things and they just looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, look, I'm just following the rules. <laughs> you know, you got to do that. You got to you gotta follow the rules. Well, yeah, yeah, I know. I put it all in there. Absolutely. I think I even had, um, I always bring sand back from the beaches too. And I'm like, I don't know how much the value is for the sand, but it's in a Ziploc bag. <laughs> it didn't matter what it was. Yeah, the sheep shop. <laughs> Is it whales? There's a lot of sheep there. <laughs> anyway, you got to pay attention to that stuff. They will come for you. <laughs> That's what happens here. So if they catch you, it's not pretty. No, it's not. And if they take you to a private room, you are in trouble. <laughs> you are going to be in trouble. So again, let this be a cautionary tale, everyone. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, wow. Well. Between 2012 and the end of 2016, Michael Cohen, the defendant, earned more than $2.4 million in income from a series of personal loans made by Cohen to a taxi operator to whom Cohen leased certain of his Chicago taxi medallions, none of which he disclosed to the IRS. Ooh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to not disclose. Specifically, in March of 2012, pursuant to a loan agreement, Taxi Operator 1 solicited a $2 million personal loan from Michael Cohen, the defendant, so the taxi operator could cover various personal and taxi business-related expenses. On April 28th of 2014, Taxi Operator and his wife entered into a new loan agreement with Cohen, increasing the $2 million loan, the principal of which remained unpaid to $5 million. How are they tossing around this kind of money, everybody? This blows my mind. Hey, can I get a loan for $2 million? Sure, why not? How about five? Sure, why not? Let's do it. Like, what? <laughs> what is happening? <sighs> Finally, in 2015, taxi operator one and his wife entered into an amended loan agreement with Cohen, increasing the principal amount of the loan to $6 million. Oh, my gosh. Each loan was interest only, carried an interest rate in excess of 12%. Ooh, that's a lot and was uh, collateralized by either Chicago taxi medallions or a property in Florida owned by the taxi operator. If this is the Mar-a-Lago property, I'm going to just fall out of my chair, everybody. This better not be Mar-a-Lago. I will seriously fall out of my chair. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. Cohen funded the majority of his loans to the taxi operator from a line of credit with an interest rate of less than 5%. 
For each of the loans at the direction of Cohen, the defendant taxi operator made the interest payment checks out to Cohen personally, and the checks were deposited. Wow, this is shady, shady into Cohen's personal bank account or an account in the name of his wife. Cohen did not provide records that would have allowed accountant one to reasonably identify this income. Pursuant to the terms of the loan agreements between Cohen and the defendant and taxi operator, Cohen the defendant and the taxi operator, Cohen received more than $2.4 million in interest payments. Just in interest payments, yikes from taxi operator one between 2012 and 2016 and reported none of that income to the IRS. Cohen intended to hide the income from the IRS in order to evade taxes. Well, that's pretty clear. <laughs> really not <laughs> hiding the ball here. <laughs> I'm not hiding anything here. Okay. <laughs> hydrate one moment. Ooh, love your nails. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. As a further part of the scheme to evade paying income taxes, Cohen, the defendant, also concealed more than $1.3 million in income he received from another taxi operator and whom Cohen leased certain of his New York medallions. This income took two forms. First, Cohen did not report the substantial majority of a bonus payment of at least $870,000 which was made by taxi operator two in or about 2012 to induce Cohen to allow tax, taxi operator two to operate certain of Cohen's medallions. Second, between 2012 and 2016, Cohen concealed substantial additional taxable income he received from taxi operator two's operation of certain of Cohen taxi uh, taxi's medallions. To ensure the concealment of this additional operator income, Cohen, the defendant, arranged to receive a portion of the medallion income personally, as opposed to having the income paid to Cohen's medallion entities. Paying the medallion entities would have alerted accountant one who prepared the returns for those entities to the existence of the income such that it would have been included on Cohen's tax returns. As a further part of his scheme to evade taxes, Cohen, the defendant, also hid the, hid the following additional sources of income from accountant one and the IRS. This isn't looking good. Now, I'm glad we all know what happens so we don't have to be worried, but this no, this is not good. Here's A, a $100,000 payment received in 2014 for brokering the sale of a piece of property in a private aviation community in... Ocala, 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 Florida. Uh, B, approximately $30,000 in profit made in 2015 for brokering the sale of a Birkin bag. What? What? Oh my goodness. A highly coveted French handbag that retails for between $11,900 and $300,000, depending on the type of leather or animal skin used. What? Oh my gosh, you had it right the first time. All right, well, let's let's take note, everybody. <laughs> no, these aren't, no, these aren't new charges. All right, here we go. We got $100,000 payment, and then we got $30,000 in profit from a, a Birkin bag. <laughs> oh my goodness, Santos has one. <laughs> oh my gosh. More than $200,000 in consulting income earned in 2016 from an assisted living company purportedly for Cohen's consulting on real estate and other projects. Dang. That's a lot. That's that's a lot. Yeah, that's, a, oh my gosh. Wow. All right. So there we go. We got some facts set out. Counts one through five. Again, anytime they're stacking counts, it's never good. <laughs> it's never a good sign. Evasion of assessment of income tax liability. The United States attorney further charges. The allegations contained in the uh, above paragraphs are incorporated, right? From on or about January 1st and each of the calendar years set forth below. I've got to cover up the chart for just a minute. Through the present in the Southern District of New York and elsewhere, Cohen, 
who during each calendar year set forth below was married, did willfully and knowingly attempt to evade and defeat a substantial part of the income tax due and owing by Cohen and his wife to the United States by various means, including by committing and causing to be committed the following affirmative acts, among others, preparing and causing to be prepared, signing and causing to be signed, and filing and causing to be filed with the IRS in or about the month of April of each said calendar year, a U.S. individual income tax return form 1040 for each of the calendar years set forth below on behalf of himself and his wife, which falsely omitted substantial amounts of income in or about the years listed below. All right, so that's the language if you are charged with tax evasion, everybody. All right, that's the language. Count one for 2012, we've got unreport. Whoa, we've got unreported $893,000. 2013 is $499,000. 2014, $670,000. 2015, $969,000. And then 2016, over a million dollars of unreported income to the IRS. I mean, this is like more than Al Capone. I mean, I get it. Times are different, but still, my goodness gracious, that's a lot. It's a lot. So that takes us to the next piece, false statements to a bank. The United States attorney further charges in or about 2010, Cohen the defendant through companies he controlled executed a $6.4 million promissory note with a bank collateralized by Cohen's medallions and personally guaranteed by Cohen. I bet there's a lot of personal guarantees that are being questioned these days. A year later, in 2011, Cohen personally obtained a $6 million line of credit from the bank. I just, these numbers are crazy. Also collateralized by his taxi medallions. By February of 2013, Cohen had increased the line of credit from $6 million to $14 million, thereby increasing Cohen's personal medallion liabilities at the bank to more than $20 million. In or about November of 2014, Cohen, the defendant, refinanced his medallion debt at Bank One with another bank, Bank Two. Yikes, to be clear, this case... Right, right. I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah, I uh, put in the title, we would do Santos, then Cohen, and then do an update in Georgia. So this is Cohen right here. Uh, all right, so we've got a second bank which shared the debt with a New York-based credit union. The transaction was structured as a package of individual loans to the entities that owned Cohen's New York medallions, personally guaranteed by Cohen. Following the loans' closing, Cohen's medallions debt at Bank One was paid off with funds from Bank Two and the credit union in the line of credit with Bank One was closed. In or about 2013, in connection with a successful application for a mortgage from another bank for his um, Park Avenue condominium, Michael Cohen, the defendant, disclosed only the $6.4 million uh, medallion loan he had with Bank One at the time. As noted above, Cohen also had a larger $14 million line of credit with the bank secured by his medallions, which Cohen did not disclose in the 2013 application. In or around February of 2015, Cohen in an attempt to secure financing from the bank to purchase a summer home for approximately $8.5 million because everybody needs a summer home for $8.5 million because that's essential. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a moment. Oh my gosh. <laughs> just like the numbers are just blowing my mind here. Again, concealed the $14 million line of credit. Specifically, in connection with this proposed transaction, Bank 3 obtained a 2014 personal financial statement Cohen had provided to the bank while refinancing his medallion debt. Bank 3 questioned Cohen about the $14 million line of credit reflected on his personal financial statement. Does anyone remember this phrase, this personal financial statement, right? <laughs> personal financial statement. This is very important, right? How you prepare your personal financial statement is the key here. <sighs> because Cohen had omitted that debt from the 2013 application to Bank 3. 
Cohen misled Bank 3, stating in substance that the $14 million line of credit was undrawn and that he would close it. In truth and in fact, Cohen had effectively overdrawn the line of credit, having swapped it out for a fully drawn larger group of loans shared by Bank 2 and the credit union upon refinancing his medallion debt. When Bank 3 informed Cohen that it would only provide financing if Cohen closed the line of credit, Cohen lied again, misleadingly stating in an email, the medallion line was closed in the middle of November of 2014. In or around December of 2015, Cohen uh, contacted Bank 3 to apply for a home equity line of credit. In In so doing, Cohen again significantly understated his medallion debt. Specifically, in the HELOC application, Michael Cohen, the defendant, together with his wife, represented a positive net worth of more than $40 million, again omitting the $14 million in medallion debt with Bank 2 and the credit union. Because Cohen had previously confirmed in writing to Bank 3 that the $14 million line of credit had been closed, Bank 3 had no reason to question Cohen about the omission of this liability on the application. All right. So I think this is important. Again, this goes to that question that I've been getting a lot, which is why didn't anyone ask about what was going on with Trump's finances? And it's because, you know, they had no reason to question it right here. Bank three had no reason to question Cohen about the omission of the liability on his application, because who would have thought (laughs) that you would lie about something like that? Yes. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Good to see you. Yeah. So this is a really big, uh, you know, this is kind of a big deal. Take a drink. (laughs) Yeah. I need more tea. Oh my gosh. Yes. Sorry, everybody. I've got a bit of a raspy. (laughs) My voice is just raspy normally. So sorry. Yep. Hydrating. So I'm saying HELOC. Is that right? Am I saying that correctly? Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't these banks do credit checks? Well, yeah. I mean, but who who thinks that someone's going to lie about $14 million? Okay, that's correct. All right. You know, it's interesting. After I posted that video on, just as a quick side note, everybody, uh, the video on New Hampshire, <laughs> New Hampshire, <laughs> I can't believe how many people have commented about how to say it properly. I know I say a ton of words wrong all the time, everybody. I'll just tell you that right now. You just have to know, just so you know, I am unfortunately working here with a very difficult Texas accent that I have to fight constantly (laughs) to get out of my way. (laughs) So just so you know, some of my words don't come out quite right because it takes a lot of work (laughs) to put it aside. Oh my gosh. New Hampshire. (laughs) Yes, Justin. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad you got home safe. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, I I can't even help myself sometimes. That Texas accent, when I get upset, I can't even help myself. (laughs) So anyway, some of my words sound a little weird. I apologize, but such is how I am. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Thank you. Just say NH. That's it. That's what I'm going to say from now on. Just NH. (laughs) All right. In addition, in seeking the HELOC, Cohen substantially and materially understated his monthly expenses to Bank 3 by omitting at least $70,000 in monthly income and monthly interest payments due to Bank 2 on the true amount of his medallion debt. Great. You guys are so sweet. (laughs) In or about April of 2016, Bank 3 approved Cohen for a $500,000 HELOC. By fraudulently concealing truthful information about his financial condition, Cohen obtained this from the bank and would otherwise have not have been approved, except for because of his fraud. Next, we've got count six false statements to a bank. Um, We're incorporating the previous paragraphs from at least in or about December of 2015 through at least in or about April 2016, the Southern District of New York and elsewhere Uh, Cohen willfully and knowingly made false statements for the purpose of influencing the action of a financial institution as defined in Title 18 upon an application advance discount purchase.
purchase agreement, repurchase agreement, commitment, loan, or insurance agreement, or application for insurance, or guarantee, or any change or extension of any of the same by renewal, deferment, or action, or otherwise, or the acceptance, release, or substitution of security, therefore to wit, in connection with an application for a home equity line of credit, Cohen made false statements to Bank 3 about his true financial condition, including about debts for which he was personally liable and about his cash flow. Right. So he made false statements to financial institutes. <laughs> That's what that went in. So let's talk about campaign finance violations. Yikes. The Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 uh, here regulates the influence of money on, oh, thank you, thank you for that, of money on politics at all times relevant to the information, meaning this trial information, which is what's what was filed here. The Election Act set forth the following limitations, prohibitions, and reporting requirements which were applicable to Cohen. Uh, individual one, whom we all know who that is, and his campaign individual contributions to any presidential candidate including expenditures coordinated with a candidate or his political committee are limited to two thousand seven hundred dollars per election and presidential candidates and their committees were prohibited from accepting contributions from individuals in excess of this limit corporations were prohibited from making contributions directly to presidential candidates, including expenditures coordinated with candidates or their committees, and candidates were prohibited from accepting corporate contributions. On or about June 16th of 2015, Individual 1, again, we all know who this is, right? Individual 1 was not named at the time, began his presidential campaign while Cohen continued to work at the company and did not have a formal title with the campaign. He had a campaign email address and at various times advised the campaign, including on matters of interest to the press and made televised and media appearances on behalf of the campaign. At all times relevant to this information, Corporation One was a media company that owns, among other things, a popular tabloid magazine. All right, everybody, I've got to take one moment, pause for a sip of tea here. We're getting into it now. <laughs> oh. <sighs> In or about August of 2015, the chairman and chief executive of Corporation One in coordination with Cohen and one or more members of the campaign offered to help deal with negative stories about individuals one's relationships with women by among other things assisting the campaign in identifying such stories so they could be purchased and their publication avoided. Chairman one agreed to keep Cohen apprised of any such negative stories. Yikes. All right everybody here's step one. Consistent with the agreement described above, Corporation One advised Cohen of negative stories during the course of the campaign, and Cohen, with the assistance of Corporation One, was able to arrange for the purchase of two stories so as to suppress them and prevent them from influencing the election. First, in or about June 2016, a model and actress began attempting to sell her story of her alleged extramarital affair with individual one that had taken place in 2006 and 2007, knowing the story would be of considerable value because of the election, woman one retained an attorney, attorney one, who in turn contacted the editor-in-chief of magazine one and offered to sell woman one's story to the magazine, Chairman and editor informed Cohen, the defendant, of the story at Cohen's urging and subject to Cohen's promise that Corporation One would be reimbursed. Editor One ultimately began negotiating for the purchase of the story. On or about August 5th of 2016, Corporation One entered into an agreement with Woman One to acquire her limited life rights to the story of her relationship with any then married man in exchange for $150,000 and a commitment to feature her on two magazine covers and publish over 100 magazine articles authored by her. Wow. 
Ooh, I didn't know that. So she she was a writer then. Hold on, I'm making a note. We have 150K plus 100 articles, all right? Let's just clear that up. <laughs> that was cheap, <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, I didn't, I had no idea about that. Despite the cover and article, oh, forgot about the cover. Sorry, everybody, add the cover, two covers. Whew, despite the cover and article features to the agreement, its principal purpose as understood by those involved, including Cohen, was to suppress woman one's story so as to prevent it from influencing the election. Between in or about late August of 2016, uh, Cohen agreed with Chairman One to assign the rights to the non-disclosure portion of the corporation's agreement with Woman One to Cohen for $125,000. Cohen incorporated a shell entity called Resolution Consultants, LLC. Oh my gosh. Ugh. For the use of the transaction, both Chairman One and Cohen ultimately signed the agreement and a consultant for Corporation One using... His own shell entity provided Cohen with an invoice for the payment of $125,000. Oh, it's so creepy. The whole thing is creepy, everybody. It's creepy. <laughs> However, in or about early October of 2016, after the assignment agreement was signed, but before Cohen had paid the $125,000, Chairman One contacted Cohen and told him in substance that the deal was off and that Cohen should tear up the assignment agreement. Cohen did not tear up the agreement, which was later found during a judicially authorized search of his office. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. And second. So that was all first. All right. That was all the first. Now we've got the second. On or about October 8th of 2016, an agent for an adult film actress, Woman 2, informed Editor 1 that Woman 2 was willing to make public statements and confirm on the record her alleged past affair with Individual 1. Chairman 1 and Editor 1 then contacted Michael Cohen, the defendant, and put him in touch with Attorney 1, who was also representing Woman 2. Attorney 1 is the real winner in this case, all right? I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Over the course of the next few days, Cohen negotiated a $130,000 agreement with Attorney One <sighs> to himself purchase Woman Two Silence and received a signed confidential settlement agreement and a separate side letter agreement from Attorney One. Actually, come to think of it, I'm having a vague memory of Attorney One. I think Attorney One got into some trouble later. Michael Cohen did not immediately execute the agreement, nor did he pay Woman 2 on the evening of October 25th of 2016 with no deal from Woman 2 finalized. Attorney 1 told Editor 1 that Woman 2 was close to completing a deal with another outlet to make her story public. Editor, Attorney 1 is in jail. I was wondering, thanks DC, I was wondering about that. I was like, wait a minute, something's clicking here. I think something happened to Attorney 1. <laughs> Oh, all right, editor one in turn texted Cohen uh, that we have to coordinate something on the matter. Attorney one is calling you about or it could look awfully bad for everyone. Chairman one and editor one then called Cohen through an encrypted telephone application. What? Come on. <laughs> what? So let me pause for a moment. We've got Santos just like taking somebody's credit card and charging like thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Meanwhile, they're using an encrypted phone to talk about hush money. Like, what is happening? <laughs> Cohen agreed to make the payment and then called Attorney One to finalize the deal. The next day, on October 26th, uh, Cohen, the defendant, emailed an incorporating service to obtain the corporate formation documents for another shell corporation, <laughs> Essential Consultants, which Cohen had incorporated a few days prior. You know, I'm feeling like I don't have enough shell corporations, everybody. Do we feel <laughs> do, we, do we feel like we all should have more shell corporations than what we have at this point? I'm just saying. <laughs> it's just the $20 Walmart burner phone. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Lisa. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> oh my 
my gosh. Yeah, seriously, I'm going to need to make some shell corporations just for fun. I just don't, I just, just for fun, apparently. Uh, which Cohen had incorporated a few days prior. Later that afternoon, Cohen drew down $131,000 from a fraudulently obtained HELOC discussed above in paragraph 19 through 21 and requested that it be deposited into a bank account Cohen had just opened in the name of Essential Consultants. The next morning, on October 27th, Cohen went to Bank 3 and wired approximately $130,000 from Essential Consultants to Attorney 1. On the bank form to complete the wire, Cohen falsely indicated that the purpose of the wire being sent was a retainer. <laughs> what are you people doing? <laughs> On or about November 1st of 2016, Cohen received from Attorney One copies of the final signed confidential settlement agreement and a side letter agreement. Cohen caused and made the payments described herein in the order to in order to influence the 2016 presidential election. In doing so, he coordinated with one or more members of the campaign, including through meetings and phone calls about the fact, nature, and timing of the payments. As a result of the payments solicited and made by Cohen, neither Woman 1 nor Woman 2 spoke to the press prior to the election. In or about January of 2017, Cohen, the defendant, is seeking reimbursement for election-related expenses. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> really? Seriously? <laughs> Presented executives of the company with a copy of a bank statement from the Essential Consultants bank account, which reflected the $130,000 payment Cohen had made to the bank account of Attorney One in order to keep Woman Two silent in advance of the election, plus a $35, $35 wire fee. What? Oh my gosh. Not the wire fee. <laughs> Adding in handwriting, Cohen added these amounts to a sum of $180,000 $180,035. After receiving this document, executives of the company grossed up for tax purposes. Cohen's requested reimbursement of $180,000 to $360,000. Oh my goodness, you people. <laughs> and then added a bonus of $60,000. So Cohen would be paid $420,000 in total. Executives of the company also determined that the $420,000 would be paid to Cohen in monthly amounts of $35,000 over the course of 12 months and that Cohen should send invoices for these payments because, of course, you want invoices. <laughs> oh, my gosh, everybody. This is a lot. <laughs> On or about February 14th of 2017, Cohen sent an executive of the company the first in his of his monthly invoices requesting pursuant to a retainer agreement payment for services rendered for the months of January and February of 2017. The invoice listed $35,000 for each of those two months. Executive one forwarded the invoice to another executive in the company, executive two, the same day by email, and it was approved. Executive One forwarded that email to another employee at the company, stating, please pay from the trust, post to legal expenses, <laughs> but retain <laughs> put retainer for the months of January and February of 2017 in the description. <sighs> Throughout 2017, Cohen sent to one or more representatives of the company monthly invoices, which stated... Pursuant to the retainer agreement, kindly remit payment for services rendered for the relevant month in 2017 and sought $35,000 per month. The company accounted for these payments as legal expenses. In truth and in fact, there was no such uh, retainer agreement and the monthly invoices Cohen submitted were not in connection with any legal services he had provided in 2017. They're really bad at committing crimes. I kind of feel like it. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the intent's there, but the execution is a little sloppy. <sighs> During 2017, pursuant to the invoices described above, Cohen received monthly $35,000 reimbursement checks, totaling $420,000. Uh, count seven, causing an unlawful corporate contribution. 
the United States attorney further charges. Again, we're incorporating the previous uh, paragraphs from in or about June of 2016 up into including or about October 2016 in the Southern District of New York and elsewhere, Cohen knowingly willfully caused a corporation to make a contribution and expenditure aggregating $25,000 and more during the 2016 calendar year to a campaign for of a candidate for president of the United States. To wit, Cohen caused Corporation One to make in advance $150,000 payment to Woman One, including through the promise of reimbursement, so as to ensure Woman One did not publicize damaging allegations before the 2016 presidential election and thereby influence the election. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Count eight, excessive campaign contribution. All right, we're incorporating again the previous paragraphs. On or about October 27th of 2016 in the Southern District of New York and elsewhere, Michael Cohen, the defendant, knowingly willfully made and caused to be made a contribution to individual one, right? We all know who that is. <laughs> a candidate for federal office, office of the president, <laughs> and his authorized political committee to in excess of the limits of the election act, which aggregated $25,000 and more in a calendar year of 2016, and did so by making and causing to be made an expenditure in cooperation. It's glitching. Oh, no. Okay, okay, take care, take care. In uh, cooperation, consultation, in concert with, and at the request and suggestion of one or more members of the campaign to wit, Cohen made a $130,000 payment to Woman 2 to ensure she did not publicize damaging allegations before the 2016 presidential election and thereby influence the election. Okay. Oh, oh my goodness. All right. Here's the grand finale, everybody. Got it. We're coming down. We're coming down to the end of it here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, sometimes you have to hop off and then hop back on again. Who's woman one? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, Jordy. I can't remember uh, woman one either. I'm going to have to look that up. Uh, McDougal. Okay. Okay, you're good. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Yes, um, I can do that. I can get that out. So the last page then of this indictment is the forfeiture application. Remember on the Santos indictment, hold on, let me move these papers. Sorry, my microphone's sensitive, everybody. Sorry about that. So here's the first page because you're asking about the number. Uh, I don't have the document number listed here. Uh, we've got 18 crim and then 602 is the number for the um, actual information itself. But yeah, it is, you know, this was an exhibit attached on. So it was filed. Um, let me look here. 821 of 18 is the date it was filed. So I've got a three, hold on here. I've got a three. I can't tell everybody, sorry about that. <laughs> You're gonna have to forgive me. Yeah, the stamp's there. We've, we do have the stamp right here, but yeah, I can't read the exact number. But if you look it up, you can find it. This one I found, uh, again, as an exhibit. So this this might help you. This is the exhibit, this is the case number. Uh, here, this is the uh, New York case, the criminal case against Trump, and then this is Exhibit 21. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so this last page, we get into the forfeiture allegation here. Let me just take a sip of tea real quick. All 
Okay, so now we've got the forfeiture allegations. Uh, again, so when we talked about Santos, you have a, you can come in, the government can come in and say, hey, anything that you got from your illegal actions, we want to take. So that's what this language is included here. So the forfeiture allegations. So they're saying anything that you got from your illegal activities, uh, we want to take that property. So that's the last piece uh, in this indictment. Then it was uh, signed here by the acting United States U.S. Attorney. So there you have that. And so there you have the Michael Cohen story, everybody. <laughs> All right. And then that takes us uh, to the uh, state of New York versus Trump. Now, this is the ongoing criminal case. And I'll just walk you through what we've got for charges. We have falsifying business records in the first degree. That's a class E felony. Uh, we have a second count also here, uh, just continuing to go on. So with all of the different records, third, fourth, fifth, um, sixth, and seventh, and then all the way through. So what they did was they listed out each and every single date where there was information that was done that was falsified on these financial documents. We have the civil case, and then we also have this criminal case coming forward. These are all falsifying business records, 13th, 14th count, uh, 15th. Let's see, we've got a voucher here um, of June 19th of 2017. So again, these all have to do with uh, the different paperwork that were filed in order to kind of cover up where that money came from. Uh, 17 again, we've got another falsifying business records. 18, 19, 20th. Here we go. All right, so the defendant in the County of New York and elsewhere, on or about August 1st, with the intent to defraud and the intent to commit another crime and conceal commission thereof, made and caused a false entry in the business records of an enterprise to wit an invoice from Michael Cohen dated August 1st of 2017, marked as a record by Donald J. Trump and kept and maintained by the Trump Organization. All right, so there you have it. That's what this is all about. All of that, um, the records that had to be filled out, that's what he's being charged with in New York. Is it a strong case? Not necessarily. Oh, 100,000. Thank you so much, everybody. This isn't necessarily the most glamorous case either, but this case reminds me a little bit of uh, something that happens a lot in criminal court for regular defendants. When we have, so if you're charged with certain offenses, we'll just say um, that the use of applesauce is illegal, all right? So if you manufacture applesauce and you consume applesauce, those are all illegal. And if you possess applesauce, one of the charges, so possession, uh, making it, the intent, the distribution, all of those are all separate criminal charges. But there's always one more charge, and that is you need to get a tax stamp to label the applesauce with. Now, the applesauce is illegal, but you should get a tax stamp or else you can be charged with the tax stamp. See what I'm saying? So a lot of places you are, you are supposed to get this particular stamp for your illegal item. And if you don't, you get charged with that. This is similar. There were illegal things done, so fraudulent records, but the big problem here was that they weren't reported correctly. So was it the fact that you had fraud going on? Perhaps, but the big issue here was that you didn't report your paperwork correctly. Very similar. It's like requiring people to get a stamp in order to be properly taxed for your illegal applesauce. Is everyone following me on that one? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is the equivalent of white collar crime tax stamp <laughs> that everybody gets frustrated about. All right, everybody. So that is the end for the Cohen case. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I got to be careful with the language I'm using. But 
So the item is illegal, but also if you don't get a tax stamp for your illegal item, you get charged with that. <laughs> so you get extra charges. But of course you're not gonna go get a tax stamp because your item is illegal. Why would you get a tax stamp for it? So there you go. <laughs> it's just it's a, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> All right, everybody, let me give you a quick overview, an update on Georgia for tonight, and then I think we will uh, be set to go. So um, here we go on our trial calendar, just to keep everybody up to date on it. Um, yeah, it's kind of sneaky how they do the, oh, wow, I'm way out of frame. Here we go. Let me bump up just a little bit. How's that? Am I better now? Should work out okay. Yeah, the president, I think everybody should pay their taxes. Why not a tax stamp? They made illegal contracts. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what they're saying, how the law is written is that they are charging you for not getting a tax stamp for your illegal goods. So you would have to confess that you have illegal items in order to get a tax stamp. In reality, there really is no tax stamp to actually get but actually asking it leads to the probable cause to take you down for your illegal item. Like moonshine. Exactly. That's a perfect, exactly. Uh, Anitra, you got it. Right. Like getting a license for moonshine. You're not supposed to have it, but if you don't have a license and you get caught with moonshine, you're charged with moonshine and not having the license. Absolutely. All right. So here's an update on what's going on in the... Um, madness <laughs> that we continue to walk through together. <laughs> so we had more of the, um, we have the demurs in Georgia. This is what I wanted to update you on. So we've got um, cheese and crackers heading for a trial on the 23rd, right? So we've got cheese bro and Powell. Um, everybody be cautious. I'm putting up the picture. Okay. This is your warning. This is your warning. Here you go. Here's the picture. <laughs> Don't be scared. So we have two of our 18 left defendants going uh, to trial, speedy trial here. So Cheesebro and Powell are being tried together in a couple of weeks. I know, I know. Jump scare. I tried to warn you. I tried, tried to warn you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I tried, I tried, I tried. Uh, so these two are heading to trial then next week. Yes, take care, Deborah. Good to see you. Uh, so with that, we had, I know, let me move out of the way, out of the way. We did it. We made it. We made it through. <laughs> so they're going to trial here on the 23rd. Today, the attorneys, uh, well, actually, it was mostly Cheese Bros attorney, argued uh, an oral demur, which means the demur is saying that there wasn't legal grounds for the indictment to go forward. That's what the demur is saying. So they're saying you need to dismiss the case because the grounds are incorrect. You have no grounds to charge Cheese Bro. He shouldn't be included in this. So they spent today already arguing, and they will argue tomorrow also. And, oh my gosh, it's hard to watch, everybody. It is hard to watch. You know, when I, when I see attorneys that are just so disrespectful and lacking just the basic knowledge of how a criminal court works, it's just, it's hard to watch. It's fingernails on a chalkboard, everybody. So Cheese Bro's attorney, he's got two. He's got the lemonade guy, and then he's got the other guy, all right? So lemonade and not lemonade. The not lemonade guy decided to go and say, again, here are a whole bunch of facts. And so because of all these facts, Cheese Bro isn't involved in this. And the judge is like, the jury is the fact finder, Dingleberry. You know, that's why we go to trial. And so no lemonade guy was like, well, it shouldn't have even br been brought up because of all these facts. And then the judge is like, you don't get to just put in new facts. That's not how court works. <sighs> so they continued to argue and it was annoying. So Lemonade and non-Lemonade guy just both went back and forth. Now Lemonade guy was yelling at the government and the government's like, wow, what'd we do? We're following the law. What are you yelling at us for? And the judge is like, y'all need to calm down. <laughs> so the hearing was just ugh, fingernails on a chalkboard. It will continue on tomorrow. <laughs> we have another one going. Uh, now, Miss Powell's attorney was not arguing. And as you know, I've said before, I uh, have very... 
um, high expectations of him. I think he does a really good job. I think his only weakness is that he's been in uh, federal court so much that he doesn't know the local rules. But other than that, he's pretty eloquent. But these two attorneys for Cheesebro, like I get it. One in particular, the lemonade guy is local and he's been in court a lot, but his attitude towards the state is just so disrespectful. It's hard to watch. It's hard to watch. So sorry, everybody. Yes, here's today. I apologize. Monday, Tuesday, and then here's today. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. All right. So they argued here. <laughs> And then we've got today. So we've got one more day of arguments. Oh, wait, hold on. So today is today. I've got one more day of arguments to watch. I apologize. They've actually already done the arguments. So on the 9th and the 10th, two days of arguments. I've only watched one day's worth. <laughs> Here we go. We're back. We're back again. Back on task. So we'll see what happens there. I'm, you know, this judge, every time I hear him talk, okay, here's today. Let's point to today so we don't forget Every time I hear this judge talk, though, out of Georgia, he's just amazing. He's like, look, you can argue all you want, but we're still going to trial. So I, I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that a lot. We'll see what happens. Again, I've got one more day to listen to on that. But um, in Georgia, we have the Garcia hearing set for tomorrow. Uh, there was a motion that was filed, a motion to intervene for the Garcia hearing uh, and an order. It shouldn't have any effect on what actually happens tomorrow, right? Tomorrow is Thursday, right? Right? <laughs> Just making sure everybody not <laughs> thrown off on my dates. Um, so we have the Garcia hearing tomorrow, and I will go over what happens there. Uh, there should be some reporting on that. I know some people are there already. But that's the big issue going on in Florida. Um, D.C., we've got objections due here. The gag order hearing comes up on Monday. And then uh, we've got the government's response on the 18th. Now, I went through the new D.C. motions that Jack had just filed the lemonade. <laughs> Where are you listening to this? Oh, it's all on YouTube. It's all on YouTube, actually. Uh, I prefer to go through Forbes. I think they do a really good job with their camera angles, actually, although it's hard to watch. It's very hard to watch. But yeah, they're, all of the hearings are posted. Yep. Can't wait for the six-part mini. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be hard. I had to kind of mute it multiple times. So we have, uh, right, so we remember the orders that just are the two motions, right? Jack had requested... Uh, jury questionnaires and protection for the jurors. He had also said, if you want to plead that affirmative defense that you were relying on advice of counsel, then you need to plead it rather than just say it to the media, right? So remember, your ink ran out. <laughs> so remember those two motions, right? She has said that uh, the defense has to reply to those motions by the 25th. So that was her newest order. Her most recent order was setting um, that Trump had to reply to those uh, motions then. So that's set for the 25th, but that's kind of right in the middle of the um, Powell and Cheesebro trial. So jury questionnaires are going to be starting in this, in this period of time, uh, and everyone will need to be coming into court on the 20th. They were already discussing jury um, questionnaire issues and things during during the hearings here. So those should probably be all hammered out. But it's looking like, again, we're on track here to go uh, for the speedy trial here. We've got a couple things that need to be cleared up in D.C. And then we've got some things uh, out of Florida regarding conflict of interest that needs to go. So that's kind of the um, docket for the next um, you know few days. So it should be uh, it's busy. It will be busy. Now, I do plan on being back again tomorrow. Um, so far, I've got, uh, I do want to go through kind of what the Garcia hearing is, and then I'll do an update. So it'll probably be a shorter live tomorrow, just catching everybody up. And I also will probably do a review of the New York civil case. But uh, I do plan to come on tomorrow, although I may not be back again for a while. We'll have to see. We'll have to see how things go. So um, I'll be back here. So this is my uh, live schedule. This is a soft, we would call this in the business, this is a soft schedule. <laughs> so tomorrow I am planning to do a um, 
Florida update. And then I'm going to try to start doing these weekly reviews on Friday. So these will probably be short lives over the next couple days, but just to give you an overview. So we've got update in Florida tomorrow, and then we'll do a weekly, a weekly update. Um, weekly review on Friday, everybody, just so long as my voice holds out. And I think it will. I've had lots of tea tonight. <laughs> I've had a lot of tea. So I will go ahead, everybody, and uh, take a moment to say I am so thankful to the moderators. Oh my gosh, moderators, you have no idea how thankful I am to you. Uh, every single time I go live, I appreciate your hard work, your understanding. I am so thankful. I just wanted to make sure you all knew uh, how grateful I am for you spending your time uh, with me. I'm very thankful. So thank you very much to the moderators and everybody else for coming by and visiting. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day and hanging out. Um, it's so fun for me to be able to share this information with other people or else I'd be just talking to myself in the corner. So <laughs> I would continue to share it just by myself. <laughs> so I will be back again, everybody, six o'clock central time tomorrow. And I wish you all the best night. Again, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow.